Okay, let's get started. So hello and welcome everyone to Changing the Game, a conversation with black athletes at the Vancouver Public Library. I'm really excited to, about today's talk because we're gonna be talking about hockey and sports. And now I grew up in a hockey family and my favorite team growing up was the Buffalo Sabres, especially the legendary line of the French Connection. And that was with Rene Robert, Gilbert Perrault and Richard Martin. So as you can see, I even have my very vintage Vancouver Canucks magazine with Gilbert Perot on the cover here. So, you know, hockey's been a big thing in my family. Um, but today, because that was going a while back, today hockey has changed a lot since then. And we're going to be discussing some of the changes that we'd like to see in sports and some of the changes that are happening right now. As part of Black History Month celebrations, the Vancouver Public Library is hosting this online conversation today with Black athletes and a coach about issues of representation, equity, and diversity in sports. My name is Kenny Snacka, and I'm the Programming and Learning Event Coordinator for the Vancouver Public Library. My colleague Jorge, who is the uh, Head of Cultural Programming, is also here with us today, and he'll be helping out with the chat. So please say hi to Jorge in the chat. Now, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that we are hosting this event from the ancestral, traditional, and stone homelands of the Musqueam, the Skohomish, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations. Now, organizations often do land acknowledgements, but what other actions can we do to make a difference? Jorge is going to share a link in the chat. That's a great resource. It's actually one of my favorites uh, to mention. It's a free, massive online course that the University of Alberta offers that you can sign up for at any time. Okay, so let's move on. Again, with the chat, make sure the little blue button at the bottom there says everyone so that you know we can you can share your conversations and also give out shout outs and high fives to the panelists today. Put your Q, uh, questions in the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, but let me introduce our guest today. So Rosie Edda is a three-time Olympian that has won medals in the World Cup, the Commonwealth Games, the World University Games, and is a Canadian champion medalist. She is also an award-winning filmmaker and directed her debut film, Oliver Jones, Mine, Hands, Heart. Rosie has had an extensive career as a journalist and has been a news anchor for Global Toronto, a senior reporter for ET Canada, and she is currently co-anchor of CTV Morning Live in Ottawa. Troy Edwards is one of the fastest rising stars of the U-17 BC Elite Hockey League's Fraser Valley Thunderbirds team. The Thunderbirds were the winners of the 2018 Chromie Cup and play out of Abbotsford Centre, the Fraser Valley's premier sports and entertainment facility. Delroy Montague started playing competitive hockey at age seven, but due to an injury was then able to transition smoothly into the world of coaching. He is currently an assistant coach with the uh, Valley West Giants U18 AAA team of the BC EHL and the head coach of the Burnaby Winter Club's U11 A4 team. Let's welcome our guests today, and I'm going to turn it over to Rosie. Hi, Rosie. It's all Hi yours. Hi, Candy. Thank you so much, Candy. Hey, everybody, wherever you're watching from, whether it's the East Coast, West Coast, in the prairies, want to say good morning, good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us. We're uh, really excited to be here. I want to thank the uh, Vancouver Public Library for having this discussion. It's um, We're celebrating Black History Month. We're celebrating all the achievements that uh, Black folk have made in Canada and beyond. And this is an open discussion about the um, some of the successes we've had as Canadians in sport. And uh, yeah, the emphasis is on hockey, no doubt, but we're going to be talking about sport in general. And thanks so much, Troy and Delroy. I'm really looking forward to, to talking with you both. Uh, before we get started, I just want to say just a, a, a quick note that um, I, uh, you know, I cover the news every day and uh, the word has just came out that uh, right now there is a state of war in the Ukraine. And uh, I just have to say, uh, although they need more than thoughts and prayers, but I have to send out a word of of concern for that uh, world event that's happening now, this state of war that the Ukrainian people are uh, are in right now. It must be a, a, a horrible time, and I have to acknowledge that that is happening. Um, so with that said, I want to move on and, and, and talk about this wonderful world of sport that we have all played a role in. And um, I want to start off first off to get just a little bit of a, of a background, a little bit of a history from you 
you, Delroy, and then I'm going to send it on over to you, Troy, and just talk about how you got into sport, Delroy, particularly, of course, the sport of hockey, and then ended up coaching. Um, absolutely. I was born and raised in Scarborough, Ontario, which is a suburb of Toronto. And being raised by a single mother, she understood that we weren't in the best environment that would be, you know, affluent as far as success in that sense. So she saw that I had a, a random love for the game of hockey, which just spawned for me seeing it and just adapting and loving to it and decided that that was the way to keep me out of trouble and bless her heart for it ever since. So I I took to the game naturally and it allowed me to just grow through it in the ranks. And, you know, the kind of cool thing about being in Scarborough is there was, you know, not that many of us, but there were a lot of black hockey players. So there was guys like Chris Stewart and Wayne Simmons and even the guys a little older than me, like uh, Joel Ward or even Kendall McCardle, just to name a few. And it was always cool to see that that was kind of, you know, one of the rare times when you'd see somebody else down a really rare path in that sense. So, you know, after rising all the way through and playing AAA, it was time for me to try to make the jump to junior. But unfortunately, an injury sustained didn't allow that. So it was kind of a shifting moment for me to see how else I could still be involved with the game. And coaching was the natural transition. So falling in love with that kind of allowed me to really appreciate not only what goes into, you know, a team being successful and an athlete being successful, but just how important it is to be a good person in that sense, because it takes a group of good people around you in the coaching staff, or even just, you know, as far as parents and even players to be successful. So it really helps you broaden your horizons to understanding that it goes into a lot more of just showing up to the rink. You know, there's a lot of learning to be done. And, you know, given the fact that Scarborough is a very diverse place, it allows you to learn about a lot of diverse people. So I always felt that that kind of helped me as far as, you know, just being naturally a coach and just naturally being able to adapt to, you know, whatever surroundings you're in and just learning naturally around a lot of people. So being in the coaching world for, I'd say out here for about about five years, it's been a little different in that sense because there are not as many uh, black coaches in the the world of hockey out here, or even as many black players from that sense. So it's, uh, it's a little bit interesting as far as, you know, understanding to navigate the, you know, the, the terrain out here and, there's been a lot of supportive people who have been able to not only identify the fact that I've obviously had a different upbringing, but that I bring something different to the table. So I, you know, I, again, you, you're nowhere without people who can look outside of, you know, what they're familiar with, which is very important in that sense. And I have to give appreciation to people like Dan Choffey and Richard Mappachuk who've been able to give me a shot or even people like uh, Alicia Rubin, Peter Rubin, who were able to recognize that I brought something different to the table and, it's, it's been just a, a blessing in disguise because people like that who you wouldn't expect that, you know, look at you and understand your struggles and want to work with you really help, you know, trip, put me on an upper trajectory. And now being able to land with the Valley West Giants and working with people like Jamie Fissette, who right away understand not only, you know, my diverse background is something that is, you know, a good thing, but it's also something to be celebrated. So it's, it's nothing but just good things as far as being able to be myself and see that people really accept that and understand that. And I, it's easy to to see the negative and really nitpick within it, but I, I try not to. I see. I see Delroy. Thanks for that. Hey, Troy, um, here you are a rising star in the world of hockey um, in the U 17 division. I mean, you, you're in the world of elite hockey. Um, Did it start off with you like just barely being able to stand up and you were on skates? (laughs) <laughs> um to be honest I don't think so I think I was like always a go-getter with hockey I think like I snapped into it pretty quickly like even now like my skating coaches say probably like some of the best skating best edges so like I kind of just like grew onto it from the start and I was just like a quick learner with it so I'm pretty grateful for that Hey, what's the dynamic like for you to be able to continue to excel in the world of sport? Do you need the family to be there with you, pushing you along? Is it friends or is it a combination of that family and friends to help encourage you as you develop in the sport? Um, I would for sure say like all of it together, like coaches, friends, family, like anyone like from the stands who said, oh, you had a good game or something like all of that just like it like sparks me to like want to come back and do it again the next day. Like 
it makes me want to come back to practice and like get better. Like definitely the support is like, like I need that. Who do you look up to in the world of sport that inspires you to get better and better? Um, definitely Olympians. Like even if it's not for hockey, I like look up to like anyone from Canada who does like sprinting, like long distance and all that. Cause I did cross country and track and field and like always been attached to running. So when I see them doing good, it makes me want to like do good at what I'm good at. That's cool. Uh, Delroy, um, I want to unpack this, uh, the elephant in the room, the ECHL, uh, they suspended a defenseman from Jacksonville Iceman for making apparent racist gestures toward a South Carolina defenseman. And um, they suspended him for the whole year. I mean, you know the story. I don't think I really need to throw out the names here. I just want to know, what do you think about that move by the ECHL? Was it, was it decisive? And is it making a difference in the world of hockey? It's, it's tough to, to necessarily pinpoint that one because I feel what transpired within weeks, months leading up to that is kind of what caused such a knee-jerk reaction. Like, it's, it's, I, it's tough for me to really dive into it personally because I don't know Jacob Panetta personally. I, I see in his eyes that there was a sense of remorse and he clearly, if he didn't do what he intended to do. And he obviously knew in hindsight that the reaction would be what it is. I'm sure he would have chose a different way to, to chirp and try to rattle him. But the reaction that Malcolm had or not Malcolm, sorry, Jordan had was something that I was like, I can relate to as well too, because I've had that moment where, you know what, enough is enough. Like you can try to hurt my feelings, but when you're trying to go to that level, it shows that there's a sense of, of just pure, that for lack of a better term, just hatred, because that's yeah. the only thing that comes from that is, is hatred. And I, I, it's not what we want to see in our game and it's not what we want to see in society. So for, for lack of a better term, it's just, it's, it was bad timing, but it's also serving as a, a, a point of reference that, Hey, this isn't an isolated incident. This has been leading up to it consistently throughout time. And you can look at it almost, uh, it's sad to say, but yearly that this seems to be happening within leagues all across North America and the world for that matter. Troy, I'm wondering if, you know, when you were really excelling in hockey and, and, and loving the game and getting into the game, I know that you, you know, you, you, you ran track and you've done all the other sports, uh, but hockey really started to take off. Did you at any one point in time, did your family sort of sit you down and give you the talk? The talk meaning um, in many black families, they go, okay, as a boy growing up, you're getting a little bit older. You have to be aware of some of the uh, systemic problems out there when you're um, a lot of parents will sit down there. They're black boys, particularly, and say, look, this is how the world works. And you have to be aware of the fact that you are seen a little bit differently. Did you have that talk? Did anyone have that talk with you within the world of hockey? Um, not really that I can remember of, like, especially in like Langley and Coquitlam and like that area, it was like never like a problem. Like we were all like kind of like one together. If you like, you know what I'm talking about? It wasn't more like black hockey players and white hockey players. It was more just like kids trying to play hockey together. Like none of this like separation, like everybody would like talk to me and stuff. It's not like they'd like single me out or anything. They like all like enjoy being there and stuff. So it was pretty good but no talk about like yeah nothing about hockey like that I wonder Troy uh you know the uh instance that I'm talking about when I'm referring to the ECHL and uh did that yeah when you heard about that did how did that make you feel um I actually like I just saw the um clip of it on TikTok like just before I came here like what happened and stuff and I was like pretty shocked that like a grown man is doing that like I would not expect that especially at like that high of a league seems like very unprofessional like waste of all that time you spent like trying to get to hockey like that high of a level same thing with like the WHL player who got like cut down it was like it's like there's like no need for that honestly Delroy what's getting you excited about what you're doing as a coach in hockey these days Oh, it's people who don't look like me invoking trust in me. Um, one of my best 
instances of that is a mentor who I hold in very high regard to this day, a gentleman by the name of Rob Rai and his wife, Dal Rai. And we met at the elite tournament in Calgary when he actually noticed that I was scouting against his team because the team I coached for at the time hadn't beaten his team in a while. And without hesitation, he walked right up to me and said, hey, what are you doing here, homie? And I looked at him and he said, I said, you know what I'm doing. And we just hit it off right away because he saw that I had a level of not only respect for the game, but just professionalism of it. And that's what gets me excited to seeing people who don't look like me acknowledging that and appreciating that. And when I was, you know, afforded the chance to be the head coach of the Greater Vancouver Comets, which is a very elite story program out here in BC, I took that as the ultimate invoking of trust. And to this day, all of the parents that I had of the daughters that were unbelievably amazing and just supportive and understanding that people who are marginalized like themselves being female hockey players that are looked as less than and also seeing that they had the only black head coach in British Columbia at that time, seeing that we both can struggle together and strive towards success is why during the hardest year of hockey, which was the pandemic year, they were able to not only stay dedicated and focused, but also understand that we can work through this together and we really leaned on each other. And that's what gets me excited about it is again, people who can take not only their struggles and not look at it as a point of victimization, but look at it as, you know what, let's be better than this together and rise towards success together. That's what's getting me really excited. It's like you flip things around. I mean, I'm thinking about you growing up in in Scarborough, where there's a fairly large uh, black population. And then you're now on the other coast uh, in Vancouver, where there aren't as many uh, black folk. But that doesn't seem to be a deterrent or uh, something that that uh, that takes away from the experience in which you're having right now. It seems like you turn it around and turn it to your advantage. You know what, people like Troy at his age that don't even think about it, but understand the fact that they are visibly different are is what helps in that sense. Because if I had the level of awareness that they have now, yeah. heck of a lot of different story. Uh, but again, it's not looking back on it in a negative in the hindsight. It's only looking for it as, you know what, I draw that from these young children that helps me as a grown man be a better person. And that's all you can do is look at it in a good perspective in that sense. You know, I take pride in knowing that I'm a little different and people will take that second or third look and kind of go, what's going on? Oh, oh okay, cool. All right. You know, so it's, yeah. it's nothing neg negative that I look at it. I just look at it as a point of celebration because I'd look at it the same way if I saw anybody in an instance that's not quote unquote society's norm and look at it and go, all right, all right. I like that. Go ahead. And that's what we want to do in this world. We want to break that. And I look forward to being a part of that. And I'm sure Troy does. And I'm sure you do as well, too. Yeah, I, I'll just tell you guys a quick little story about myself. So uh, growing up in Montreal, I ran track and I uh, used to train at this place called Clo Robillard. And they, they still do it now. You have to show a pass to get in to uh, access the track. And I would uh, come in, access the track. But every now and then the uh, the attendants weren't there. I don't know, maybe they're on a break or something. So you just go in because, well, the door is open. So you'd walk in and um, they'd come back from their break and then they would just make a beat line for me and go, wait, I didn't see your pass, not anyone else's pass. They'd come to me because I was one of the only black people working out there. And it was very frustrating and I didn't have the language for it, but you know, basically it was, they, I was being racially profiled. Like they wouldn't ask anybody else who walked in after me for their pass. They would just notice me. And it was very frustrating and I didn't really have the words for it, but I just continued on. But you know what I find very encouraging and exciting about where we are right now is like you said, Del Delray, it's not to look to the past and go, oh, I'm really angry about that. For me, it's about the fact that we can openly um, celebrate Black History Month, proudly do so. Um, we can all come together and talk about our successes because there was a time when you, you kind of even felt a little bit weird if a lot of Black people got together. You'd be like, OK, it might it might make people uncomfortable. And it's like, why is that? We can all like Troy, myself, you, we can talk about our successes and be really proud of that. And that's what makes me excited about sport because we can openly speak about whatever it may be that may either not work for us, make us feel uncomfortable or things that we feel we can improve on. And diversity is one of them. And to, to, to bring that and to unpack um, the fact that people who traditionally um, 
uh, hockey, you don't see a lot. It's not predominantly black, but so what? <laughs> um, there are a lot of sports where it's not predominantly um it's not predominantly Asian or it's not predominantly white or South Asian or what have you or indigenous, but there are people who come into that sport and add to it. And that's what I see what's happening in the world of hockey. There, it's just undeniable. And yeah, there are still some relics of the past um, where um, some folks in the past have had a, a, an issue with people who look different, but when it, what gets me excited is when I see Troy and he's excelling in the sport and he's like, I just want to be the best in this sport. And so, Troy, I just made this long speech here, but I want to just uh, bring you into the fold here and just uh, just to unpack what I'm saying. And I mean, you weren't there in the past. You're here now. And I just wondered what makes you excited about the sport of hockey and you being so, so involved in it? Um, just like the friends overall, like just the environment, like just how it's like all around, like no hatred from anyone, all like brothers, friends, all together. No one's being separated out or anything. We all like each other. It's like very welcoming. Uh, what was it like, Troy? Did you get to watch the gold medal uh, game, the women winning that gold for Canada? And um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna hope that you did and ask you, what was that like watching if you did watch? Uh, of course, the Beijing 2022 Olympic gold medal. Yeah, I was actually not able to watch that. We had a practice that night. Ah. But like, yeah, I did watch some of the um, highlights of it, though, on YouTube. And it was pretty exciting seeing, like, our girls win gold. Like, like not being able to watch the World Juniors this year because it got canceled. But being able to, like, see them win was, like, very, very nice to see. Yeah, that's um, – it's always um, something when you can – um, watch a team come together, which is you know, track and field. I mean, I was a 400 meter hurdler and I ran in my lane all the way around and it it's a very individual sport. But the one time we were able to become a team is when we run the relay, we place fourth in the Barcelona Olympics and it's, and it's an incredible feeling to play with a team. And I've just wondered if you both can talk to me about the dynamics of playing on a team sport and um, how it, it can be quite physical and uh, you really have to rely on your teammates. So can you tell me about the breakdown, Delroy, how you coach the team to, to, to work and operate as, as a unit? Uh, absolutely. Um, inclusion over ego is the best way to describe it as in, you know, we all have a little bit of that ego. We all get to that elite level because, you know, at some point we were the best of the best, but, understanding that, you know, much like a good orchestra or a good band, everyone's got to play their part and play different instruments at different times to create that beautiful music. So it's, it's buying into that and buying into the mindset of being a family, understanding that, you know, just because one person doesn't have their best day doesn't mean that the 19 others can't pick them up when they're down and understanding that it's not us against each other. If there is a problem, it's us against the problem. And we got to take that down together. So that's always been one of the things I instill in, as cheesy as it may sound, the one thing that I've always been able to appreciate is just the sacrifices that parents have to make and the amount of financial sacrifice that they have to make. Because hockey, to me, is the most expensive sport in the world. When you add up everything, $6 skate or skate sharp and $6 for a roll of tape, $10 for Gatorade and snacks on the way to the rink, $20 for the kid just because he needs it to go show up with his buddies and buy something that's important. It's a little bit of all of that. And I always remind the players of, you know, giving back to your parents and showing the appreciation of it whether it be, you know, working hard every day, every chance that you get to, or even, you know, doing the little things like helping around the house a little bit more. Those are all things that I personally love to instill because that is what you show your parents the ultimate thank. And not only that, but your coaches. Troy, can you talk to me about the dynamics of working together with your teammates so that you can achieve success and win? It's definitely picking each other up. If someone has a bad game, like if our people who like we rely on for scoring goals, like if they're not producing, we know to like pick them up, like say, like let them know that they're still good. Like they're still part of our team. Like just because like they're not producing tonight doesn't mean they're like letting our team down. Like everybody has their own jobs and stuff. Like if everybody gets their job done, then we're like running smoothly. But like if someone's not like producing, like other people are there to pick them up. It's just like all nice around. 
Troy, how do you find a balance between sport and, and going to school? I mean, how do you find time for all of it? I mean, I'm lucky. I know there's somebody on my team who he does IB at the same time, like extreme advanced school. And he's able to like, he's doing it in the car ride and stuff on the way to practice every single night. Like he's pretty good at it. But like, for me, it's kind of like when I don't have it, I'll be like, kind of like go home after practice 10 o'clock, like maybe do like 15 minutes of it. And then like flex block or something. I'll like try to finish it off. (laughs) But yeah, it's not that, but I managed to get it all done. That's amazing. And as I understand it, you're also a certified Red Cross lifeguard. And, you know, you love going cross country skiing and you play football as well. Yes, I did. Is that coming from your family where they want, you know, where they encourage you to take part in all these different sports to become more of a well-rounded individual? Um, So what happened was when I moved from Coquitlam to Langley and I got to my new school, there is um, three friends that I I started to get to talk to and stuff in my grade two class. And one of them played football and he's like, oh, you should come try it. So I'm like, all right, I'll try. And I played three seasons with the North Langley Bears. And then it came the time for either hockey or football because they were like, like bumping into each other all the time. So I was like, well, I guess it's going to be hockey. And then like, here I am today. Um, What are your plans for university or college or and hockey? Um. That I'm for sure trying to get some sort of hockey, like for university or something. And if that doesn't work, I'll probably maybe hopefully junior A and like university on the side. Cause I'm thinking of maybe doing I or like ideology. If that's what the hearing one is, I don't remember what it was called, but like for the hearing, something for that. That's amazing. Uh, Delroy, um, tell me this. Here we are. We're talking to Troy, you know, AAA hockey, rising star. Um, and here you are coaching hockey. So what are the kinds of qualities that a star hockey player needs to have in order to be that, that, that great player? Troy just alluded to it, being well-versed in different assets of life that you never realize will pay dividends until – you grow up a little more and you see it actually pay off in the real world. So, you know, things like being athletic for sure help, but also understanding that there is a world outside of sports and that not only you being a student athlete can help you get to that, but also can help you make your dreams come true. Right. I don't think there's very much better than being able to do what you love and being able to get an education towards financing the life that you want at the end of the day. So It's that to alone, along with being, you know, a good human being at the end of the day, you know, genuinely wanting the people around you to get better as well as yourself and pushing them to to get to that point. And, you know, again, it's lack for lack of a better term, just wanting to be a better person for the world to be a better place. Delroy, I have to go jump back to um, the the incident uh, with the EHL and the player and uh, what was conceived uh, perceived as a racist act and then him being suspended. I, I'm, I'm wondering about that, just doubling back to that for another second here and asking you specifically, it, it, have you ever felt discriminated against Delroy? And, and, and if not, okay, but if so, um, did, you, did, did you speak up about it or do you feel... Um, that's some that's something that you wouldn't do you wouldn't speak out about that um there's actually a very sad but specific isolated incident that happened out here so when we were at our provincial championships in the spring of 2019 uh they were hosted in trail bc but unfortunately people from different areas in that general region decided to flock to the main street on a saturday afternoon right in front of the arena that we were playing at And the two teams that were playing that afternoon happened to be the two most multicultural teams. That was the North Shore Avalanche, the team I was coaching at the time, and the Surrey Falcons. Um, At that time, on our way to uh, to the rink, it was about maybe a five to ten minute walk from the hotel. Uh, We interacted with these people who had very blatant anti-immigrant, for lack of a better term, white supremacist signs. Uh, I was offended for the, the, the city of Trail because I'd say as a as a whole, they had been nothing but welcoming and, you know, for lack of just sweet people. And it was sad to see that, uh, you know, a small group of, for lack of a better term, dummies were there 
being ignorant, display, display, you know, making their, their voices known that, sorry, even now to this day, it still it chokes me up in a good way that the parents from Surrey wrapped their arms around me. And before a game, when we were supposed to kick the crap out of each other, they had my back because they were from a different background as well, too. And they necessarily did not appreciate the fact that I was standing out there with my assistant coach at the time, Cheyenne, who, who had my back. And that's something that will always remind me that, you know what, just because you're not, you're necessarily a, an opponent doesn't mean that you're necessarily an enemy. And I hold those parents to, to the highest regard to this very day for having my back in that moment. Cause as you know, and I'm sure Troy knows that if we're ever exposed to anything like that, we can feel very isolated and alone. And that's one of the worst feelings for anybody to feel. So to know that they had my back is still to this day very heartwarming. That's a devastatingly yet beautiful story. Devastatingly beautiful story. I mean, you know, the, the act of the racist act is, is, is what's horrible, but it's beautiful to know that, uh, that there are people, good people, probably, definitely there are more good than bad and that you can be surrounded by that good and protected by it. Troy, um, there is something about the physical sport, the physical aspect of hockey where, you know, you guys get, um, it gets, it can be very physical at times and, the, and things can get quite heated. Um, do you, how do you handle that, uh, the emotional that, that sometimes clashes with the physical side of that, of the sport? Anytime there's like a scrum or anything, I try to stay out of it. I don't like, I don't like going in there because that's like not what I'm about. I'm not a like rough and tough person go in like punch a kid. Like I do not do that. I'm just here to like produce my skill, produce passes and all that. When that does happen, like usually my teammates, like they know that I, like I'm not about that and they'll like step in for me. If something happens, I'm getting like dragged out or something, they'll come in and take the guy. And like, yeah, it's just like nice all around knowing that they'll do that for me. Like, even though, like, I wouldn't do that for them, but they'll do it for me. Yeah, that's really great. That's really great. Um, do you ever, um, Troy, because I'm, like I said, I came from a sport, track and field, right? You know, you get in your lane and you stay there and then you walk off the track. That's it. it you just rarely touch anybody unless the very few instances in the relay when it gets, you know, you can kind of mix it up a bit, but really there's just hardly any physical contact. Um, do you, how do you approach every game? How do you get into that headspace and get ready for battle, if you will? Um, I just put in my music and I just like listen to like my favorite songs and stuff, just get ready for it. I know that every game is going to be physical. So I'm not thinking going in there thinking I'm going to like, try to like toe drag around somebody like I don't think about that I'm thinking like be hard on the puck all that because there is somebody who's going to want to take my head off at some point <laughs> so that's got to be like aware all the all times <laughs> what kind of a coach are you Delroy or how would you describe your coaching um your coaching your style it's of cool. coaching <laughs> it's cool. it's new right like uh, a lot of manners and discipline that that my mother instilled in me hundred percent, but um, very new school in that sense where I love to, to pick the brains of other colleagues out there. Like uh, a good friend of mine now in the coaching world, Harry Friedman, who runs a, a goalie, a goalie instructing academy. I, I love to pick his brain because, you know, goalies are a special breed of their own and, you know, he knows better than that. And I love, I love talking to them, but also just talking to other people and other athletes and even people in different walks of life, right? Like i uh, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to work with at-risk children right now and even just talking to them and listening to, to their upbringings and positive people in their lives. I love hearing about that because then I can also, you know, pull from that and use that as arsenal in that sense as far as a tool in my coaching resume. So it's just, to me, I just like to, to, to relate that to the type of person who I want to be. And that's just expanding my circle and learning as much about as many people as I can to help these kids also learn and just, you know, broaden their horizons. But for lack of a better term, I just, I'm a very, very disciplined, but also relentless coach as far as their pursuit of success, because I, I believe you have to achieve success in nothing less, whether you win or you, it's a lesson. There's no losses. I've got one more question for each of you before we get to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I'll just tell you quickly about myself. So 
Um, and to everybody watching and uh, taking part, thanks so much. Uh, this is this has been a fantastic conversation already. Uh, again, we want to thank the Vancouver Public Library. And um, I just want to say, um, here we are talking about changing the game, and we're celebrating Black History Month. And for myself, I ran track and represented Canada in three Olympic Games, and um, I was really um, fortunate to get the opportunity, I was interviewed all the time, right? So, you know, you'd run a race and you get interviewed. And then I got the opportunity to work on the other side of the camera as a journalist. It just came to me in Montreal, CFCF 12, CTV, Ron Roosh, he's a, you know, a, um, a legendary sportscaster. He gave me my first job. And then I parlayed that into a career after track. Um, but it really, if it wasn't for sport, if it wasn't for track and field, giving me that opportunity, I would be where I am today. So um, sport was a way for me to see the world and to represent Canada and to really build my, my confidence and my self-esteem. And I'm really proud of what I accomplished. And it takes, it took a while to be able to say that, believe it or not. Like when I finished running, I just went, eh, it's okay. You know, doesn't everybody run track and make it to the Olympics? But now all these years later, I'm really proud of that accomplishment. So I want to ask each of you. So I'm going to start off with you, Troy, and talk about where do you, where would you hope? What's your biggest dream for yourself and the sport of hockey? How far would you like to go in your wildest dreams with the sport? And then what would you want to do with it? Uh, in my wildest dreams, I would say the NHL, yeah. but maybe realistically, maybe junior A or something like that. And then hopefully university or something, D1. What would you do with it? And then, okay. So you'd get there and then, you know, can you, can you picture even like, I know it's a long while, <laughs> but even, you know, build up on that dream a little bit more, maybe extend it a little bit further, if you will. Uh, maybe like play my full years out, get like, a degree in something so in case like the hockey doesn't work out I have second options not to like close doors behind myself like yeah. I can't just like hope that hockey is going to take me all the way knowing that it doesn't for most of people and yeah hoping I can get like some sort of education to take me somewhere not working like a job that I don't enjoy when I could I had all these years going up to it when thinking just like hockey was going to take me there but like realistically like I have other options that I can do like not my whole life needs to like reside around hockey. That's cool. Delroy. Um, wildest dreams would be something to do with professional hockey, uh, whether it be the NHL or AHL, whatever. I, I love that. You know, there's out of all the professional leagues in North America, there's only one black head coach and that's Jason Payne, the Cincinnati Cyclones. So uh, there's a lot of candidates out there ahead of me that are a lot more viable and been in the game a lot longer. So I'd like to help push that along but realistically i'd like to be somewhere to help kids like troy where i could you know help at the, the local level and help them get to that level of you know post-secondary junior whatever it is so that way they can you know parlay that into whatever it is they want whether it be within the game of hockey or working with youth per se or just even something as simple as you know running their own business or you know helping their parents retire anything I, that's that's the goal is to to use hockey as a tool to help these kids and not only that but help myself be a part of their lives as well too because I just want to be a part of helping people achieve more than they think they are they're capable of yeah thanks still right thanks Troy um we're gonna go to uh questions from the audience and we got one already here from uh Rafe and um he uh, Rafe asks what systemic issues most need to be addressed to begin moving forwards and begin moving toward a level playing field for everyone. So I'm going to direct that question to you, Delroy. Um, if you feel that there are some, you know, uneven um, issues and, and some issues that uh, plague uh, players um, of color that could be addressed, that could help level that playing field. Delroy. Uh, it starts with education, I feel. And, when I say that, I'm mainly directing that towards understanding the fact that you can't necessarily be judged by a group of your peers if your peers don't necessarily experience the same things that you do. So there's a lot of unfortunate incidents that have been on the rise within, you know, uh, sectors of Hockey Canada that they've been able to address. And 
not necessarily been addressed the right way, but you can see that they're taking steps in making sure that the diversity is there. So it starts with, you know, hiring, educating those that are on staff, maybe even doing a thorough breakdown of, of instances that have gone and transpired and maybe understand the fact that the people in place need to learn a little bit more that they already already have. And it's not necessarily an indictment on them to, to, to say that they're not smart people, but they can't really see something from a perspective that they're not really, you know, afforded one. Yeah. Um, got a question for you, Troy, from the audience. Rob writes in, um, who do you see as a diverse role model for young men and women in hockey? So obviously you've got role models that are, um, that are white, but do you have any role models that you can speak of that are um, diverse and are uh, some, a role model of color that you really do look up to and that you can speak on? Does it have to be for hockey or? Well, like they did ask anyone. for hockey, but you know what? Why don't we expand mm. on that? And uh, because you did allude to that earlier that you do, um, you, you, you have such a wide interest in sports. So why don't we just open it up for you to answer? Um, I would just say probably Andre de Grasse. Like when I watched him sprinting with Usain Bolt, I think it was yeah. 2019, I think it was. It like it really like it put a smile on my face watching that. Like I don't know why, but it was just like something so nice to see. And then for hockey, I'd probably say PK Subban during his Montreal days. Ah, uh, yeah. I think he was the only like the only black person I saw like in the NHL, and I just like like watched him all the time and all the stuff like he does now, like outside of hockey, like the charity work and stuff, is like really good to see. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask. Um... Delroy, um, very recently, and I can even direct this to you, Troy, but very recently, the Boston Bruins retired jersey number 22, Willie O'Ree's jersey. They did it uh, just uh, January 18th. Um, and Willie O'Ree is one of, uh, wow, one of the vanguards, one of the uh, first Black players in the NHL and, and, you know, and he did have to deal with um, a lot of racial taunts, but he stuck to it and he broke those barriers and then they retired his Jersey. Um, when you heard about that, or I don't know if you even saw the, the ceremony Delroy, how'd that make you feel? Um, historically, if you look back at the archives, Boston doesn't have the most shining of bright instances um, we don't need to go through that. Unfortunately, you can a Google search will take care of that. But to see now that they're honoring him, it, it was really cool because his story itself is, is, yeah. is boggling. The fact that he played pretty much with one eye and he was blind in his left eye is, is amazing. And let alone that, people like to try to you know, knock it down by saying, you know, well, he didn't have that many goals, assists, or play that long. And it goes beyond that. It's, it's the symbolism of it. And to see that they acknowledge that and are putting that in it's their eternal rafters. That's wow. What do you, you're speechless when you hear about something like that. You know, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it is pretty amazing. Um, Troy, do you, do you know anything about Willie O'Ree? Um, he played um, for the Boston Bruins and they retired his number just uh, January 18th, 2022. He was one of the first black players in the NHL. And he did unfortunately have to deal with those kind of, really um, terrible racist taunts and so on. I mean, we're talking about a whole nother, you know, a long, a fairly, well, it wasn't that long ago. I mean, it was several decades ago, but he had to deal with that and he kept playing and broke those barriers. Um, do you know anything about Willie O'Ree, Troy? I know it's a little bit before your time. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, but it does sound, it sounds pretty, um, almost like, almost like a, one of those like, superhero stories if you like think about it like or like an underdog story kind of like you would never think that like a black person from that long ago would like get their jersey retired like Wayne Gretzky has his jersey retired you wouldn't think to like compare those two together like both got their jerseys retired but it's like pretty good to see like a black person getting like acknowledged for their like incredible stuff they did, even if they didn't like put up those hat tricks every single game or something like just to like recognize like what they did like outside of hockey or something like that, like what they had to go through emotionally and stuff. Yeah. And, and Troy, do you find that um, sometimes even when you do have to overcome some obstacles, whether it's a, 
maybe a bad practice or a practice that didn't go so well, or even a game that didn't go so well. How do you get through the slumps, the, the, the times when you're not feeling so amazing? Just, just stepping into the practice room after like, just what the board is after, like after a bad game, like the first practice, I'll like be like upset or something, but then like, like just seeing them all together, like all saying hi, like they acknowledge them. There's just, it's so nice to like come and I like get out of the mood like instantly. And Troy, is there anything, um, again, I'm fascinated with the sport of hockey. Like I'm, I'm always fascinated by it. when I see the bodies going up against the boards and, and the, you know, the contact and the physicality of it, 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 it's amazing. And then I also know that words can be exchanged, you know, you know, a little bit of taunting here and there. Um, you appear, I could be wrong, but it seems like you are the, the you're like the silent assassin. Like you're not really going to be out there talking smack or anything, but uh, <laughs> right. Um, but, it, how do you block out the the noise, the literal noise, like people in your face talking smack to you? How do you deal with that? I really, I don't say much to them, but if I know like they're a little goofy or something, I might like say a couple words back. But like if it's like like a good player or something, I'll just be like, okay, yeah, whatever, and I'll like go do something like next shift or something, like line him up or something, like take the puck from him and like outskate him. Like, just, like, stuff like that. But I'm never going to, like, go out of my way to be like, oh, yeah, you're bad at hockey or something. Like, no, I'm not like that. Delroy, you were smiling when I called Troy, like, the silent assassin. I just, uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit about that sport and about how it can get kind of a little personal on the ice sometimes. Yes, hockey players can chirp with the best of them. So you got to be creative in how you deflect. You know, I like to... I like to try and tell my players, just ask a really random question and it'll throw them off. Like, your chances are you'll probably get them to smile in that sense, right? And just takes the edge off of it, you know? I'm never going to ever tell them to shy away from a little of the physical, but just randomly ask a guy, like, hey, man, chips ahoy your Oreos. And he'll look at me, like, what? Just the stuff like that, just to mess with them a little bit, you know? Take the psychological edge and mess with them a little bit in that sense. <laughs> um. Okay. You know what? We're just about out of time. And uh, so thank you so much for the questions that you sent in. We love engaging and, you know, going back and forth and chopping it up. So uh, I think that this will be my last question to you both. And um, I just want to ask you, what is it about the sport of hockey? Man, there's something about it that it's almost like delicious. Like you can almost like live off of it and like eat it. Cause it's so good. Like, especially when you got your team. So my favorite NHL team, Montreal Canadians, you know, I grew up in Montreal. So, you know, right. And the story, I know, I know you're shaking your heads. I know. <laughs> um, but there, there's just something that's so juicy about the sport and whether you're watching pro triple a uh, women's hockey, I mean, it's all fantastic. I just want to know if you can just encapsulate and describe to me, why is it that I love hockey so much? And it's such a beloved sport in Canada. Why is it that we love it so much? And why do you love it so much? So I'm going to start off with you, Troy. You can answer that question for me. Um, Personally, I, I love the skating. I love being able to like do what most people can't do. Like, my skating would take like years for like any person to start now to do. And I just like, I love like the difficult of it, like the, how hard it is. And like, I live for the, like the big, like dangle moments, like the big, like clips and stuff on TV and stuff. It's so, so cool to see even like your teammates doing it, even if it's not as good at the TV ones, it still like gets everyone fired up. Nice. Nice. Delroy. Oh, wow, man. <laughs> just little details. Like just, walking into the rink and that, that first feel of the chill, the cold and the smell, the sounds, just the, the environment, you know, just the buzz, the energy, you walk into the room. There's just being with that group, the, the camaraderie, the cohesion, like sports are a microcosm of society. And just when you get the, the right group of everyone together and just all towards the same goal, it's just, it's, it's beautiful. Like the world, all the problems in it, there's enough bullcrap to keep us, you know, entertained and worried. But for that hour and a half to three hours that you're in that rink, it's just oof, nothing better. It's euphoria. It really is. I know it sounds 
cliche as it is, but it's just it's a happy place. And that's that's hockey is just so beautiful for that. It's it's the hardest game in the world, but it's also can be one of the most beautiful from it, right? Yeah. Just everything about it, it's just never ending. Yeah. Well, I've been in my happy place just wrapping with both of you, Delroy and Troy. Um, really, it's been a pleasure. And what a great way to celebrate Black History Month with um, with you both to talk about some of the hardships, but mostly some of the great things uh, about being Black, about being in sport, about being a Canadian, about um, uh, being so dedicated to the sport of hockey, to coaching. Um, I really want to thank you both for being so open and so candid. And and, um, and I want to thank Candy for creating this uh, this safe space for us to wrap and for and to talk and to and to shine so um, and thank you all for watching for your questions and for listening in it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much again to the Vancouver Public Library and thanks Jorge for taking care of the technical aspect of things and candy it's been a pleasure thank you I'm going to send it over to you now Great. Thank you so much, Rosie. Your moderation today was excellent. I mean, I don't think I've seen or heard a better moderator. I mean, I love them all, but I was like so impressed today. And Delroy and Troy, you guys were incredible. I really want to thank you so much for helping us to celebrate Black History Month with you. And it is an honor to have you all with us today. And I mean, hey, it's getting me super excited about hockey, right? So tonight, the Canucks are celebrating Black History Month, in case you didn't know, with their game against the Calgary Flames. And they also unveiled a special jersey in honor of Black History Month. And I have to say, it's pretty sharp. I'm sure you've all seen it. It's pretty sweet. Um, So I hope you're going to tune in for the game tonight to help celebrate Black History Month. Uh, We would love your feedback for this event. As a public institution, of course, we are here for you. We're going to share a link to the feedback form in the chat. It'll take you about a minute to fill out. I wanted to let you know about another event that we have coming up on Wednesday, April the 6th at 7 p.m. It's going to be about contemporary Black artists in Vancouver. And we have Jan Wade, who's going to be here with us. And she has an exhibit on right now at the Vancouver Art Gallery and Nyla Lewis-Williams as well. So the details for that event will be posted soon on our website. And then coming up next Wednesday on March the 2nd, we are hosting an author talk with filmmaker and writing writer Chuck Kwan about his new book on Chinese restaurants around the world and their cultural importance for communities at every continent. So Jorge is going to share a link in the chat for that event. And if you want to watch the event again today, or if you want to share it with your friends, we're also going to share a chat or share a link in the YouTube uh, to do that. So thank you again all for coming out tonight. I'm going to put up the slides. We're going to leave the um, the chat box open for a bit in case you want to click on any links. And we do really appreciate you showing up to support the athletes today. So take care, watch the game tonight and happy Black History Month.